I'm Allison Singer with the Autism Science Foundation, here today with Dr. Timothy Roberts. He is a member of the faculty of the Center for Autism Research at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and he's vice chair of research in the Department of Radiology at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. So Dr. Roberts, your work focuses on using MEG technology. Can we start off by helping understand what exactly is MEG technology? Oh, so MEG, which is uh, short for magnetoencephalography, so we'll call it MEG from now on. Um, this is a, a, a new uh, brain scanning technology or a brain sensing technology uh, that allows us to look at the function of the brain, um, not only look at the spatial organization of uh, where in the brain functions happen, but it also gives us um, a real-time view of this, so we can look at not just where but also when things are happening and watch um, brain activity as it circulates um, from one part of the brain to another. So the, um, the MEG um, technology is based around a machine, a very special machine that can um, record tiny, tiny magnetic fields that are coming out of your brain. Now you may not realize that there are magnetic fields coming out of your brain. Um, every time you have a thought or a feeling, you don't have paper clips jumping up and sticking to your head. But um, as a matter of fact, you do generate these tiny, tiny magnetic fields. And uh, the MEG machine uh, is essentially a, an array, a helmet, if you like, um, consisting of very, very sensitive um, detectors of these magnetic fields. So it, um, it can pick up this activity, which is really coming from the nerve cells of the brain, uh, but it can pick it up spatially and in time. And what are you learning about children or adults with autism by using the MEG technology? So we are very, very interested in some of the difficulties uh, children with uh, autism have processing sound and speech. So um, we think that this is ultimately the root of the difficulties we see uh, with language and communication skills. And so what we're able to do with the MEG machine is to look at um, the activity of the brain, the timing of the brain responses to sounds, to um, speech elements, and to words, uh, to try and um, uh, watch the, uh, the patterns of activity as signals move from one station to the next uh, in, in brain processing. And the key thing that we're finding is that even simple sounds like a beep are associated with um, a split-second delay uh, in the brain's response. And the trouble with that is that more complex sounds uh, seem to be, uh, and words, seem to be um, associated with longer and longer delays, which um, leads you to, uh, uh, to think that perhaps the children are having a difficulty processing um, uh, the speech stream that we uh, take for granted. And maybe an example of that is uh, in a word like elephant, when everyone else in the room has finished making an image of, the, of an elephant, of a four-legged animal, um, maybe the child with autism is still processing the sound L. I think one question that parents often have about imaging in general is that people feel that it's basically showing a picture of what we already see uh, clinically in the children. But I think there's some confusion as to how imaging can be used for diagnostic purposes and how we can use imaging uh, to develop new treatments or improve existing treatments. So how, how can uh, radiology be used in that way? So I think there are several answers to that. And, um, uh, one is to remember or to reflect on, upon the fact that the, uh, the autism spectrum is indeed a spectrum, and uh, that uh, essentially no two children with autism are alike and um, have uh, greater or lesser uh, extensive difficulties uh, with such things as language and communication. So by taking a very biological view, so we're not really taking pictures anymore, we're examining the, the function of nerve cells uh, so by taking this biological view, we're able to identify um, perhaps which children uh, are, are experiencing this delay in signal propagation and which children are not, because it's certainly not the case that all of the children uh, behave the same way. And then one can imagine that this uh, leads to a, a separating into perhaps two groups, one who might benefit from um, uh, emerging speed-up therapies uh, versus the other group who perhaps um, have other issues which would uh, take a priority. So I think one way of thinking about it is not to uh, make a diagnosis, and indeed many of the children already have the diagnosis, but to try and um, address this rather uh, pervasive issue of, of variability across the spectrum. 
and try and target the biology rather than just making pictures. So just to make sure I understand what you're saying, you're, you're saying that what you can see in the MEG is differences in how um, children are responding to different types of treatment and based on what you're seeing, the type of treatment that might make the most sense for different subsets of children? Well, I think what we're looking at is the biological function of the brain in the children with autism. And we appreciate that that's different in different children. Um, and uh, this, is, this is now an emerging um, application of it, if you like, a hopeful application that we'll be able to separate uh, children into, um, into subsets who might benefit from different types of treatment. And indeed, use this technology for measuring um, responsiveness uh, to such therapies as they're developed. Now, those therapies are uh, in their infancy at the moment and uh, might be um, uh, behavioral uh, interventions, uh, and they might indeed in the future be pharmaceutical interventions that we would also be able to suggest whether some children are a good candidate for that drug and some children perhaps um, would be better served with intensive uh, behavioral therapy. So maybe by way of example of how the MEG technology can be used, can you talk a little bit about how you'll be participating in the ongoing Arboclifin trials that are currently being done by Seaside Therapeutics? Oh, absolutely. So one of the things that we found in the children with autism um, using the MEG technology is that the normal rhythmic activity that we have in the brain, um, resting rhythms, are, um, are a little different in the children with autism. Um, now, one of the emerging therapies, and it's an experimental therapy, um, Arbaclofen, uh, acts on the connections between nerve cells in the brain, and it's really those connections which may give rise uh, to, these, uh, to these rhythms. So uh, the idea that we had was perhaps we could use MEG to characterize the severity of the uh, difference in the rhythms um, um, before the drug is administered, and then perhaps monitor um, the effects of the drug um, by repeating the MEG scan and looking to see how these rhythms change in response to the arbaclofen drug. If you'd like to think about this as a, um, a non-invasive um, measure of whether the drug's doing what we think it's going to do. Of course, it doesn't necessarily predict the ultimate outcome, but it does give us an idea early on whether we think the drug is working or not, and this might be a future application of the MEG technology. Will that data also help us in the future to predict uh, which children might be the ones who will benefit from arboclofen? That's exactly right, of course, because as we've uh, discussed, the children with autism are also very different. Um, some of them have um, more profound differences in these resting brain rhythms uh, than others, and those are the children that you might expect to benefit mostly uh, from a drug like arboclofen because of how its biology works. One of the benefits of being in a large center like CAR at CHOP is that you have the opportunity to really interact with a wide range of scientists and a variety of disciplines and an opportunity for real cross-disciplinary um, research and, and intervention. How does your work fit into the broader spectrum of the work that's going on at CAR? So I think that's a, that's a, a great um, reflection again of, of uh, the organization uh, that we work in. I think that um, because I'm an imager, I think imaging is central to, uh, to all of this. But in many ways, because we're looking um, at the brain, we are something like halfway between the basic science of genetics uh, and the clinical realities um, and the behavioral realities of the, of the children. So perhaps we're able to offer a biological bridge uh, between the outstanding genetic research um, and the very real clinical scenario. And does the group meet and talk about uh, specific uh, children who've been in different studies or who are involved at CAR so that you're able to really use all the different uh, disciplines that you have here to improve their outcomes? Yes, certainly. So there was no, there's no doubt that um, it's very difficult to address uh, a complex problem like autism uh, with a single uh, line of, uh, of inquiry. So we have basic scientists, we have neuropsychologists, we have imaging scientists, including psychologists, and also physicists and engineers trying to develop the best techniques. We have biologists uh, who are um, trying to interpret those imaging findings and make them um, clinically relevant. So this is really um, a multidisciplinary team um, drawing on a variety of expertise um, necessary to solve this incredible puzzle.
when parents are thinking about participating in research, one of the questions we've heard is, you know, what is the experience like for a child who is doing a study involving Meg? So what is that experience like for the child? Well, to paraphrase one of our recent uh, uh, children who participated in the study, the experience is very cool. Um, the MEG machine, it's, it's a strange one. It looks rather like um, a 1950s hairdryer. Uh, you sit in the chair uh, and there's a helmet hovering over your head. Uh, but it doesn't put anything into your head. There's no radiation. There's no danger. There's, it's just fun. Some of the children think it's like um, being in a spaceship. Um, so they sit on a chair, and we pick up the magnetic fields coming out of their brain, and they watch a movie. And they just have fun. And then how do you use the data specifically from that study? You know, how do we push it forward and help those children who participate in the study to actually gain skills as a result of the data that you find? So I think what we're able to do is identify um, in the brain the core problems that an individual child uh, might have. So whether they're to do with um, social interactions, or whether they're to do with um, language and communication. And this, I think the, the most immediate help that that can be is to direct um, their ongoing um, behavioral um, interventions and day-to-day -day care, uh, whether it's in the school district or at home pay attention to sounds, speak a little more slowly, uh, things like that. It's very practical, very hands-on. I think in the future, we will be um, identifying parts of the brain which should be uh, subject of, uh, of drug studies and drug interventions. But for right now, we're mostly trying to address this problem that different children are simply different and, um, and would benefit from a, a more personalized approach. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today, and I wish you continued success with your research. Thank you very much.